So what did I have next then? Yes, so the chemistry thing. So um, that's useful, it's fun stuff. Um, and there's like, uh, there's fun things on the internet. I was trying to get this demo working um, where you can put your own text in, but my browser conked out. They're trying to run it all in your browser with TensorFlow. So there's lots of really neat implementations of this stuff already. Um, and I'll just show you similar words. There's uh, ones where they run it on very large open data sets. And so you can put in like the castle and it will find you other words that are similar based on um, the ranking of the, the word to vec score. And this is mostly old English literature, so the words don't seem reasonable, um, but they are old words for castles. Um, a more useful uh, use, use of this that was um, just last year um, is to try and use it for um, learning word embeddings for a truly complex domain like chemistry um, and just learn things automatically in an unsupervised way from it. Um, so this paper I put up on uh, Zotero the other day already. This is just a blog post describing it. Um, and I have the actual paper as well. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that really well. Okay, it's pretty small at that view, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. Depends on how much you zoom your screen. Um, oops. Right. I need more screens. This is my problem. Um, okay, here we go. So this paper, um, which was in um, Nature, uh, was really cool. And so trying to do that where they're basically running um, running word embeddings, but on um, abstracts of scientific articles, right? So they took um, a whole bunch of um, articles from chemistry, so like academic papers, and took the abstracts, right? So usually in a paper, you've got some kind of text at the beginning of your paper like this, that has a summary. And, it, and in chemistry, they're very specific. They would put like the formula that they're working on and the result they got and how much magnetism they detected. So their abstract is really um, informative and detailed and like precise, right? Um, so what they did is they ran um, WordVec um, and they tried Glove and some others, which we'll talk about next, um, on a thousand journals um, with a vocabulary of 500,000 words from like the entire 20th century worth of scientific articles and just ran these kind of things on those abstracts. But they did like, they had to do specific things because now, you know, it's chemistry. There's going to be formulas like this. There's going to be words that are, you know, and not in other databases. Um, so they did a bunch of things that are specific to chemistry to make sure that it um, works out. Um, and if they have oxide of or other phrases that are meaningful in chemistry, they would just turn those into one word, right? So the pre-processing we talked about you know, pre-processing, you'd have um, stemming, removing the and and that and of, right? And converting words like computer and computing just to compute. In chemistry, they would do even other things and say, well, like if you ever see, say, oxide of something, you know, make that its own entity because maybe that's meaningful on its own. So they put a bit of domain knowledge into the model first and just in terms of pre-processing it. And then they ran word to vec on these things. And um, then they can get basically for different formulas of uh, chemicals, of elements, they could get um, relationships, whether they're similar or not. Um, and this idea of what we talked about, uh, you know, king minus man plus woman equals queen in the relationships, they could get a similar kind of thing, saying ferromagnetic versus uh, nitrogen, oc nitrogen oxide <laughs> and iron magnetite or something, um, no, iridium and magnesium. Um, gives you some other relationship. So maybe ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic are like directions in this space and also all the elements. So they did this and they're just trying to see what they could find. Um, so they found a bunch of different things um, that were like important uh, words is they can map words like um, thermoelectric to bunches of materials that relate to each other. Um, so they described their model in here and it's exactly like 
um, similar to what we talked about, except instead of just words, they had to have um, encoding layers for chemicals as well. So they came up with a way to do that, but using the same kind of idea. Um, I guess for every just chemical entirely, they just have a, a one hot encoding. So rather than saying there's a lithium vector and a oxygen vector, they would just have this LiCO02 as its own vector and say, is it in the document or not, right? And so they would know that that word, um, that's what that is. Um, then they had um, essentially the same kind of approach we had, maybe with a bit more um, hidden, well, this is just a hidden layer. This is just the encoding um, layer that we have of, of weights that you're using in your logistic regression, essentially. Um, and then they have the output layer. Um, and so when they plot their thing on PCA2, which they did here, um, then um, they could plot down, say, chemical formulas and elements into the space and see certain directions, right? So in the very first one they saw with PCA2 on this thing, they found that, you know, this direction means that the thing further down is an oxide of something above it, or this is a structure. These are words that describe structures of materials, and these are oxides of elements above them, right? So instead of like the direction meaning capital of a country, it's oxide of some element. Um, so that seems like it could be kind of useful. Um, obviously it's, it's helping them learn this structure from something that we already understand, like chemists understand this space intuitively, but now you're automatically extracting that from a document, from a document database, right? So that's kind of neat. Maybe this on its own isn't useful on its own, right? So um, what else did they find? Um, they had pretty useful um, uh, maps they would kind of infer from that. So they had other words in the document like thermoelectric and photovoltaic and could have relationships between doc between elements and words that kind of fit what they understand, right? Um, so again, these are kind of things that they already know, but it's neat that they're extracting it purely from text without any guidance or really um, uh, information. Um, the really useful thing um, that actually could be useful, and it's more maybe more for research, is that they could look at time then and say, um, how, what was this? Um, predicting when people would discover certain, not elements, but like thermoelectric properties. So I don't know, it's a very specific chemistry nerd type thing. But um, there's certain things that people had discovered in research and chemistry over years. And what they're plotting here, I think, are um, Um, right, they're trying to find certain properties that can basically make them have the, have better electrical properties of of materials. They can make better circuits and chips, right? And so uh, the predictions. I think they did another plot. But essentially, they're plotting out um, when something was actually um, discovered in the literature, and then um, when the model would have predicted it, it would have been discovered if it were given only the data from the previous years. So like, what's the next most interesting, you know, pair of chemicals to research here? Um, and so it could predict that, and then it was actually pretty right if you look, if you give it past data without showing it to future. And so you could use this as a way to tell you what to research next. It's like, this is gonna be hot in three years, you could start researching it. And it doesn't know anything, it just knows about all these abstracts, but it does know about time, because it's got the papers from the 1920s to the, the 90s. Um, Let's see what else was interesting. There were other, there was one definitely other one that's kind of very neat, I think. Um, the periodic table itself, they kind of like projected the data um, in a different way. Here they're using TSNE, there you go. So you guys did TSNE as well um, in, um, in that previous week. So um, you try to uh, come up with that uh, encoding and visualize it. And they visualized um, all of just the, the elements themselves in terms of their space and redistributed it. I'm sure they rotated this image. Um, and what they get is not the periodic table exactly, but it's not not the periodic table, right? I mean, things, the colors in the periodic table inside here match the colors for the elements here. And it's almost grouped them into a way that is related um, to the periodic table, you know, because they obviously have similar properties, right? These um, different um, materials. And those properties all had to be described in abstracts, not in any kind of uh, numerical way, right? 
Um, so yeah, that was kind of a, a neat thing. So you can look at that. Oh, here's more about the predictions of like what to research next um, based on other materials. What else? Analogies. Yeah, so I'm making predictions about what, what um, materials we should look at next and um, context words. So for each chemical, the, the context words. But you could do this in any domain. Um, you know, um, basically, if you have a large enough corpus, that's what you could do. And so um, people know that. So there's lots of now trying to basically evaluate um, how these different models work, how good they are. Um, and this is something I'm not that familiar with. I just found it recently, but I know there's many different um, scoring methods. Yes. So rather than just saying, um, you know, how accurate are you on classifying something? They're now trying to come up with um, different scoring methods to say your way of coming up with encodings for tech for documents is good at predicting sets about um, like li literature or um, some uh, sentiment. You know, this thing about you know humans answering uh, questions on like question banks about their kind of mood or something, and so your your model. You could use any of those scoring methods to come up with um, a way to uh, to predict what the next answer would be or the next word. And so, what they're trying to do in all these methods are um, evaluate those better, um, because now uh, there's many many different things they could be used for. But that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves. Um, so um, the other one that I was going to talk about, if people have questions, feel free um, to ask. The other one I want to talk about was glove. Um, is another method for creating vectors, and it was came after WordsVec and was very popular as well. Um, and then. Um, that's where we'll stop for today. And like someone said, there's a more recent ones. And if you notice, those scoring methods are using um, all often have the word BERT in them or something. Um, it's because BERT has kind of taken over um, doing that. And that kind of builds on the things we've been talking about, but it requires a bit more neural networks. So we'll talk about that after we've done uh, deep learning a bit. Um, but GLOVE was this kind of um, different way of adding to um, the word to vec approach, but use a bit more of a probabilistic um, weighting. So um, rather than just doing these like relationships of words locally, it also wants to come up with um, global um, occurrence of the word. So how likely is that word in general? So a really rare word that happens to show up a couple times in sentences doesn't mean that you should always start adding that to your autocorrect, right? Although sometimes I feel like my phone does that. I type a word once, it just suddenly becomes this word I want to use. Um, you don't want that, right? You want words to actually have their probability of occurring that's a bit more based on their like normalness and frequency in all the documents you're looking at or in all documents in general. Um, so yeah, so sometimes if we're just using um, cosine similarity and the counts we have from some documents, um, we might get really rare words um, because they were in the document and they are close, but they're not something that shows up that often, right? So how do you um, balance for something being rare and something being um, normal um, is kind of what they were trying to deal with here. Um, so what you can do that is use um, probability and so um, they use um, one way to do is take co-occurrence probability for words um, like very large uh, database like word like Wikipedia or Gutenberg uh, English literature or some uh, literature or document database um, for a different language, um, and you say you have a prior then right you say how how likely is um, this word to show up in general, right? Ice is pretty common. Uh, some other word would not be as common. Um, and then come up with a, a probability of them um, showing up together, right? So what's how much more likely is ice than steam? 
right? So that's how they would have this uh, relationship. Um, and what they're doing though is forever these words, right? So um, they have a probability of, in this case, what's the probability of the word of the K being um, near the word ice, right? And near would be, you'd have to define it based on your particular model. Um, and so how likely is the word solid to be near ice? How likely is the word water to be near ice, right? Much more likely. How likely is the word fashion to be near to ice, right? Less likely. Um, and uh, if you take ice and steam uh, and you're taking the ratio of their probabilities, then you can see how much more likely um, solid ice shows up together versus solid steam. Solid steam, it seems really weird, right? Um, that's why it's much less uh, likely. Um, so you get these ratios of probabilities, how much more uh, likely is one word versus another. And so when you're trying to pick the next word, you could have the, the word to vec kind of nearest neighbor approach of scores. Um, and then you could also, on top of that, use um, these probability ratios to say, now pick the ones that are more likely and, and ignore the really weird words. Um, and so they basically add that on to uh, the word to vec approach. Um, and yeah. Um, and so the glove approach is trying to get this this meaning. Um, I don't know if it adds more meaning to it really, um, but it's 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 trying to actually add add more global meaning of the word itself. So you have a, at least a relationship between that word in a larger context, and then in the documents you're looking at, you can still have them um, connected. Um, and so it helps kind of soften that um, weirdness that um, word Devec has, which you can even see in that one that I pulled up because it's got lots of rare literature and I said castle and I was like, okay, sure. Like I'm sure in some books, Elo shows up near castle, but no one knows what that word is anymore, right? So in a, in a glove approach, these would all get lower down and you'd see something priorly is not so bad or keep. Fortress, there you go. See, fortress should be near the top because castle and fortress makes more sense, but in their documents, maybe it doesn't show up as frequently as Genfrith, whatever that is. Um, so that's what they were trying to solve there. Um, yeah. And then I guess at the end of that one, I have uh, some other uh, links. The other links I was showing there, um, I have on the end of these slides. And like someone said, um, these aren't the latest ones on Learn, so I'll post these up right now. So people have them, and um, yeah, that's the main um, thing. That's any questions? We will talk about it a little bit more after we um, do deep learning, um, because. Uh, these um, people have introduced these kind of transformer networks that kind of do some of these ideas, um, but using um, deep learning uh, and they're very effective, but they're really quite recent. It's just the last couple of years. So we'll get to that. Good. Um, so we didn't get to SVMs at all. I'm not going <laughs> to start it. Um, I'll try to decide whether I'm going to record a video this week and give you SVM or we'll just move it to next week. Um, for support vector machines, because they're kind of uh, a well-divided um, topic on their own. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll decide about that and announce to you guys uh, what it is. But for now, that's where we're leaving it. And um, if there's any questions, I'll take them. If not, we'll uh, talk online. And I will have my office hours tomorrow morning, um, like I said. so. Um, and if you have specific questions or um, want to talk one-on-one -on -one about things, we can try to set that up too. Okay.